What are the newest recommendations for treatment of irritable bowel syndrome? And what are some easy interventions that we can use to improve patients' quality of life? I've recently been seeing more patients with very severe irritable bowel syndrome, even to the point that they're requiring hospital admission, which is very rare because irritable bowel syndrome is 99.9% .9 an outpatient issue. The problem is patient symptoms can become extremely severe. And while this pain is centrally mediated um, and has to do with the brain gut axis, it is very important to remember that these patients are experiencing true pain and true symptoms. So here's the latest dot phrase that I made, and you can see that it starts with irritable bowel syndrome, and then the first thing to do is actually classify the subtype. And so there's four different subtypes. There's IBS with constipation uh, predominant, diarrhea predominant IBS, mixed bowel movements, so diarrhea and constipation, and then U is actually one that I just learned about. It's really considered in patients without a uh, significant abnormal pattern to their stool. And to make the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome, uh, we actually use the Rome criteria. And that is by having recurrent abdominal pain on average greater than one day per week in the last three months with two of the following. It's related to defecation, there's a change in the frequency of stool, or there's a change in the appearance of stool. And if you actually read the American Journal of Gastroenterology, Enterology updated guidelines, uh, one thing they actually talk about is that IBS is no longer considered a diagnosis of exclusion. Previously, in order to diagnose IBS, people would need to get biopsies, they would need to get colonoscopies and EGDs to do an extensive workup to rule out other causes before making that uh, decision. However, nowadays, they actually recommend a positive diagnostic strategy as compared to a diagnostic strategy of exclusion for patients with symptoms of IBS to improve cost effectiveness and also to avoid you know, procedural com complications, increased anxiety, things like that. The first thing that you need to counsel the patients on is the FODMAPS diet. And that involves counseling the patient on decreasing their intake of fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. The reason is because FODMAPs lead to increased GI water secretion and fermentation in the colon, which leads to bloating and more symptoms, uh, luminal distension and triggering of meal-related symptoms. So what are things that are high FODMAP foods that should be avoided? So dairy-based milk, yogurt, and ice cream, wheat-based products, beans and lentils, and some vegetables and fruits should be avoided to reduce some of these symptoms. Instead, low FODMAP foods such as eggs and meats, certain cheeses, almond milk, uh, rice, quinoa, and oats, and other vegetables and fruits are more um, you know, beneficial to patients with irritable bowel syndrome. So that's your first easy intervention to offer these patients. Next, you're going to talk about what kind of predominant type of irritable bowel syndrome do they have? Do they have constipation or do they have diarrhea? Now, if they have constipation, the first recommendation is to increase their fiber intake, and that's with using psyllium or Metamucil. And if that's not working, then they actually, uh, you know, recommend starting a, an osmotic agent such as Miralax. And then finally, we've got these two medications called Ametiza and Linzess. These medications work by uh, activation of guanylate cyclase C on the intestinal epithelium, which increases cyclic GMP levels and, reduce, and results in increased chloride and bicarbonate secretion into the uh, lumen. This basically helps to treat the constipation that they're experiencing, and also there's some reduction in pain-sensing nerve activity. The only problem with these uh, medications is that they may take some time for insurance to actually authorize. So that's the main downside, and we don't have this in available inpatient, but definitely something to consider to be initiated as an outpatient. And then uh, consider anal rectal testing if concerned for pelvic floor disorder. Now, a lot of these patients are going to have abdominal pain, and it's typically this kind of spasm, you know, abdominal pain that's relieved with defecation. And so we actually have these antispasmodics, hyoscyamine and dicyclamine. However, these actually are only recommended for short-term use uh, at this time. There's actually an updated guideline from the American College, uh, uh, the American Gastroenterology Association, which recommends against antispasmodics, but does recommend peppermint oil, which is actually well known to reduce the spasms associated with irritable bowel syndrome. The difference between hyoscyamine and dicyclamine is that hyoscyamine is shorter acting, and you can actually use it as a uh, as-needed medication, whereas dicyclamine is longer acting and typically needs to be taken regularly. 
Both of these are anticholinergics, which reduces contraction of muscles in the GI tract, which is why it's thought to improve the uh, spasms and, and abdominal pain in IBS. And then finally, if patients have diarrhea, you can consider bile acid uh, sequestrants like cholesteramine, but the quality of evidence is not really that high. Generally, what you have to do is if you know, it's continuing to have resistant diarrhea and resistant symptoms, you'd have to initiate rifaximin, 550 milligrams TID for 14 days. They also recommend checking for celiac disease, uh, a CRP and fecal calprotectin to make sure that you're ruling out other causes of uh, diarrhea, such as uh, inflammatory bowel disease or celiac disease. And then lastly, for global symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, it is extremely, extremely beneficial to start them on a tricyclic antidepressant, such as amitriptyline, nortriptyline, or disipramine, 10 milligrams at bedtime. Now, there are more advanced therapies that are out there, but they are very, you know, rarely used medications and really would be in the wheelhouse of a gastroenterologist at that point. But I think in our role as hospitalists, internists, and primary care doctors, we can really get the ball rolling for a lot of these patients and improve a lot of their symptoms. These are some initial therapies that I think are often not even really started at, you know, with their primary care doctor. And so it's very easy for us to just get involved and get them started, at least on a basic regimen, while they wait to go see their uh, gastroenterology doctor. Let me know down in the comments below if there's anything you found particularly effective in treating these patients. And thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video and peace.